Listening Library presents Path of Beasts by Lee and Tanner. Read for you by Claudia Black. These are the words of an old Furuna song. Who can walk the beast road? There must be three. Two mortal enemies with one between them who is both friend and enemy, native and stranger. Where does the beast road go? To a timeless place from which no one has ever returned. What does the beast road hold? Terror for those who hurry, death for those who linger. But for Furuna, it holds salvation. Before Goldie Roth, the last person to walk the beast road was Herodan's father, accompanied by two of his brothers. The three men were not mortal enemies, far from it, but their country was being overrun by the invaders from Mern, and they were desperate. Dan, who was six years old at the time, was to remember their departure for the rest of his life. None of them ever returned. From the Museum of Dunt, a hidden history. The captive city. It was night time when the three children entered the city of Jewel. Ragged and filthy, they clung to the shadows, their feet making no sound on the cobbled paths. They had been gone for weeks, torn away from home without the chance to say goodbye, and they were bursting with impatience to see their parents. But they carried secrets with them, secrets that would get them killed if they were caught by the wrong people. Early next morning, Toadspit, Bonnie and Goldie muffled their faces with scarves and winter hats and went down into the city. The streets were not as quiet as they had been the night before, but the fear was still there. People hurried to the markets or to their jobs, peering nervously over their shoulders and falling silent whenever they saw a squad of mercenaries. Look how scared everyone is, whispered Bonnie. Isn't it horrible? We'd better copy them, said Toadspit. And although they were almost bursting with excitement at the thought of seeing their parents at last, the children hunched their shoulders and peeped anxiously from under their hats until they looked as timid as everyone else. When they came to the fallen bridge, which was not fallen at all, but spanned Gunboat Canal in a graceful arc of bluestone, they separated. Toadspit and Bonnie hurried toward their house, and Goldie continued along Misery Street, which led to the plaza of the Forlorn. Now that she was alone, her excitement had turned to worry. The last time she had seen Pa, he had been suffering from dreadful nightmares, and Ma had had a hacking cough that showed no sign of getting better. Goldie had only been gone for a few weeks, but a lot could have happened in that time. She slipped in the front door of her apartment, her feet making no sound on the tiled floor. Pa, she called softly. Ma? There was a cry from her parents' room, and Ma came flying out with her hand over her mouth. When she saw Goldie, she stopped and jammed her eyes shut as if she didn't dare look. Are you... are you real? She whispered, her eyelids fluttered. I've dreamed about you so many times, and woken with my heart in tatters. I'm not sure I can bear to do it again. Ma, said Goldie, hurrying toward her. It's me, look, it's really me. But it was not until Ma was folded in a bear hug that she could be persuaded to open her eyes. Then she began to cry. Oh, my lovely girl, how we missed you. Are you all right? Where have you been? That vile Fuckelman. She stopped and glanced at the wall of the adjoining apartment. Frau Edel, she mouthed. I think she sometimes listens to us. <gasps> she put her lips closer to Goldie's ear. The Fuckelman said you were in spoke. Only, of course, he didn't know that it was you and Toadspit and Bonnie. The protector made sure of that. So what he said was, the missing children were in spoke. Only then something went wrong and he said that the missing children were probably... Her voice broke. Probably dead and that it was the protector's fault. I didn't believe a word of it, not a word, but still. Oh, my sweet. Tears flooded down her face and down Goldie's face too. You've shrunk, Ma, she whispered. Your cough's not worse, is it? No, my cough's the same as ever, and your pa is no better and no worse. Goldie held her mother at arm's length. But you have shrunk. No, darling, you've grown. 
You're getting much more like my sister prays every day. Ma touched the little bluebird that was pinned inside Cody's collar. You know, I thought you had disappeared. Just like she did so long ago, and it broke my heart. But here you are. And you've still got Brace's brooch. I thought you might have lost it after all that has happened. I'll never lose it, whispered Goldie. It gives me courage. Ma hiccuped a laugh. <laughs> courage? Dear me, that's something you never lacked. Oh, I wish your pa was here. He's gone to the market. He should be back any minute. Now tell me exactly what happened to you. No, better wait until pa arrives. Just tell me a little bit. How's Bonnie and Toad's bit? Are they safely home too? It was impossible not to start telling the story. Goldie had just reached the point where Toad's bit was captured when the front door opened and Pa stood frozen with shock on the threshold. There were more tears then and more explanations. Pa had shrunk a little too and there were new lines on his forehead, but his chest was still broad and comforting and his eyes were growing happier by the moment. When Ma had made hot chocolate and Pa had rummaged in the shopping baskets and brought out a tea cake, Goldie started again at the beginning of her story. Her voice was no more than a murmur, but when she came to the part about Harrow, she lowered it even further. There are two important things you should know about him, she whispered. First, he was behind the bomb that exploded in Jewel last year. Ma gasped. That bomb had killed one child and wounded several others, and the city's militia had never found out who was responsible. And second, Goldie paused dramatically. Harrow is really a fugal.